So last week we uh, we began. We've been looking at Christian giving for for a few weeks now, and uh, we saw how we ought to give. We kind of went through a series uh, on that, and so last week we began uh, examples of New Testament giving. How what, so? We established very clearly that there was giving um, that um, that the church was even as we take up an offering today, and we you know as God provides for us, we give a portion back to Him. Um, we began to look at examples of how that was used within the New Testament church, and I thought really we, would, we only had three points, so I thought we would get to all of them last week, and I was surprised to see we only got through the first one. So uh, I just got a lot, lot did you all, did you guys hear that? Just the presence, you know? It's, um, so anyway, the first point that we looked at last week and we saw very clearly in, in the Word of God is that, number one, they used uh, that which was given to assist those in need in order to provide for equality in the church. And we saw some examples of that as they assisted the poor, uh, the poor saints in Jerusalem. We saw uh, a general word meaning weak. Uh, Paul admonished them to care for the weak. We saw care for widows. So we saw examples of them caring for those in need to provide for equality in the church. And so just as a quick refresher, I want to read a couple of passages here in 2 Corinthians 8. Uh, first of all, verse number 13, uh, to, to remind, refresh our minds in this point, he says, For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. And so that's where we get that term equality within the church. And then let's look at Acts chapter 4, one other passage that we read last week. Acts chapter 4, verse number 32. And so we see that the pattern of the early church was this, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And that was something that we mentioned last week, this commonality between uh, the believers. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man a according as he had need. So that was the way they did it. They, they, these things that were sold, they didn't just give them directly to the poor. They came to the apostles' feet, and then they were distributed through the church, according as those had need. And so that was something that, uh, that, that giving was used for in the early church. Now, Brother Gary and I were talking about this afterwards, and I think it's worth pointing out, we were in agreement that we don't believe that this meant that they sold everything that they had, that they were selling their primary dwelling places. Um, you know, at the end of Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls were added to the church, right? And, and if you look back up in, in Acts chapter 4 here in verse number 4, it says, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Some translations went, render that, that the number of the men within the church increased to 5,000. So by the additional believers that were added there. So 5,000 men alone, you know, not to mention all the women and children. I don't believe there were 5,000 homeless Christians in Jerusalem at this time. I don't think they sold all of their dwelling places. But I think the end of this chapter kind of clears that up and explains what's going on here. And Joseph, in verse 36, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So where there was an abundance, and they said, we don't have any need of this. There's no need for me to have this excess here. It can provide for those that are in need within the body. They got rid of those things. And so there was not an excessiveness. There was a, there was a selling of that which, and this was of great encouragement to the church. They were greatly comforted by the example that Barnabas set for, for them here as he got rid of these excessive possessions for the furtherance of the gospel and the provision of the church as a whole. So that was what we looked at last week. That was point number one. They used these resources to assist those in need in order to provide for equality in the church. So this week, number two, uh, secondly, what did they use these finances for? Remuneration for those laboring in the Word. And that's set forth for us clearly in multiple passages. I want to go to, um, I decided late last night to change the, uh, the verse I wanted to start with here. Let's go to 1 Timothy 5 first. 
And then we'll back up because I want to spend more time in 1 Corinthians 9, but this is kind of a good springboard text. 1 Timothy chapter 5. And 1 Timothy, if you remember, is where we started in our study of church order. Uh, that's kind of where we got our title from, and, and it's been sort of our launching point for many of the topics that we've discovered. Because as Paul wrote to him here, he says um, in 1 Timothy 3.15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So he's establishing some order here within the churches as he writes to Timothy. And so one of the things that Paul deals with here is found in 1 Timothy 5, and it's this idea of remuneration for those that are laboring in the Word. Um, 1 Timothy 5 and verse number 17, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they, or particularly they, who labor in the Word and doctrine. This word honor here means price. It equals price if you look it up, and it, and it means, Strong says, a value that is money paid. So worthy of double price. There is a value. These are valuable uh, men that labor in the Word of God. And so uh, bestow this double honor on them. They ought to receive something for that labor. And in case there's any ambiguity there and you're not sure about that, verse 18 clarifies it. He says, For the Scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. As he's plowing that field, that ox should have the liberty to reach over there and grab some of that corn, right? And enjoy the fruit of his labor. And also the laborer is worthy of his reward. So one of the ways that this giving was used, used was to provide for those that were laboring in the Word of God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. 1 Corinthians 9. Now just like I said with our last topic, in assisting those that were in need, this is, uh, there are numerous scriptures that we could read on this topic, but I'm not going to, we're not going to read them all. But I do want to read enough like we did last week to drive home the point that this is frequently mentioned in the Word of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 1. And by the way, the primary purpose and the goal of the church is to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, right? Jesus said, you shall be witnesses unto me, Acts 1.8. That's our calling, right? Go now into all, all the earth, right? Go out into all the world teaching the nations. And so that's our responsibility is to declare the word of God. Well, this is one of the key ways that that happens, right? As there are those that have devoted themselves to going forth and declaring the word of God, there is provision that is made for these so that they're able to do so. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse number 1 the Apostle Paul begins here, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yea, doubt, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. Your evidence of this apostleship. Mine answer to them that do examine me is this. Have we not power to eat and to drink? So what we're beginning to understand here, and you kind of get it from the beginning of, of the first Corinthian letter, you get it in the second Corinthian letter, is that Paul is under fire, right? Paul is being, being examined, and there are those that are bringing accusations against him, and Paul is having to defend himself. And say, listen, if anybody's been faithful to your soul, if anybody's evidenced himself to be an apostle among you, it's me. You are my children in the faith. I have labored uh, and given myself tirelessly for you. And so he, he says, uh, for those that examine me and that would bring accusation against me, don't we have power to eat and to drink? Don't we have liberty to do that? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles? And as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, we have right to marry? I mean, you wouldn't hold that against the apostle Peter, but will you hold it against me? We're just getting an idea of some of the accusations that they've brought against the apostle Paul. Or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working? Don't we, don't we have the right to do that because we're laboring so faithfully for your souls? Who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? Doesn't this agree with that which God establishes in the Old Testament? If you remember last week, we saw that this idea of caring for those that, in, that were in need, this is just in the heart of God, right? 
And so this didn't change between the Old and the New Testament. We saw the same principle and pattern in the Old Testament. There were tithes that were taken up in the Old Testament. He said, that's to be left there the, as you bring forth a tenth of your grain and all of these things. That's to be left for the Levite and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow in your land. So we saw that the heart of God, He cared for these that were, weren't able to care for themselves. And He encouraged His church to do the same. God didn't change between the Old and the New. Paul's saying the same thing here. He says, this, is, this was the practice in the old. God's heart hasn't changed in caring for those that labor and declare in the word of God. For it is written in the law of Moses, verse number 9, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. That's what we just read in 1 Timothy 5. Um, Doth God take care for oxen? Is that why God wrote that? Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? Paul says, doubtless, it's for our sakes. No doubt this is written, that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? That was something we read in the book of Romans. He talked about uh, providing for these saints that were in need in Jerusalem. He said, if you've been partaker of their, if you've benefited from them spiritually, then shouldn't you also care for them carnally? That's just the way that it ought to be. This is labor also, and it ought to be rewarded. Um, verse number 12, if others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. He says, you've got men left and right taking advantage of you in this area, and charges are being brought against us about how loose we've been with this and how we've taken advantage of you. And he said, we haven't. In fact, we've done the opposite. We've actually labored with our own hands and provided for ourselves instead of receiving wages from you. He says in verse number 13, do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? Again, he takes us back to that pattern that God established in the Old Testament. Those that gave themselves to the service of the Lord and serving in these religious matters, in these spiritual matters, God provided for them. And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So Paul establishes this. He says the way that it ought to be is those that labor in spiritual things, they should be provided for in natural things. That should be the norm. Now, I want to I go ahead and read the next few verses. That They're not specifically in, in line with the topic that we're discussing now, but it's worth reading because I don't want you to be confused by this. Beginning in verse number 15, and we've got to set the context for this chapter also because the previous chapter, Paul is dealing with this idea of there are things that we have liberty to do in Jesus Christ. And an example is there were those that had liberty to eat meat that was offered to idols, right? But just because they had liberty to do that didn't mean they should always take advantage of that. Why? Because sometimes there are weaker brethren watching and you might hinder and you might wound that weaker brother, right? So he, he just got through dealing with that. Um, in verse number 9 of chapter 8 says, But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. He just got through dealing with that. And so we need to realize that this is still fresh on their minds as they're reading this letter. And so now the Apostle Paul in verse number 15 is going to say, I, 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 in chapter 9, I just set forth what we have liberty to do, right? I've just set forth by, from the Old Testament Scriptures, this is the way it ought to be. But you know what? We haven't taken advantage of this. And he says in verse 15, But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glorying void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. You know what? Whether you pay the Apostle Paul or not, he's going to preach the Word of God to you, right? doesn't matter because that's not what his goal is. His desire is the salvation of souls, right? I became all things to all men that I might by all means save some, he said. And so knowing the terror of the Lord, therefore, we persuade men. That's his burden. It doesn't matter about the wages. He's just saying, 
You, you ought to appreciate those that labor and care for your souls like that. But we haven't used that authority over you. You won't make my glory in void, he says in this area. Verse number 17, For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. One way or the other, it's like Jonah going, going to, uh, running the other way, uh, getting on that boat and running away from Nineveh. Guess what, Jonah? You're going to Nineveh, right? God, Paul says, this charge is laid upon me and it doesn't matter. I've got to preach the Word of God regardless. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it willingly because I desire that eternal reward. I desire to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. What is my reward then? Verse number 18, verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ, how? Without charge. My, I care for your souls. And so at the end of the day, whether I'm paid or whether I'm not paid doesn't matter. Whether I receive wages from you for this or not, it doesn't matter. And he says, I won't take any reward from you guys because it's better for your soul's sake that I don't receive anything for that which I do. I make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. All right, so he labors on this point with them. And to me, because he spends so much time here, it highlights the fact that this is a hard topic for a true minister of the gospel like Paul to teach. This is a difficult thing to talk about. This is not a comfortable topic to deal with, but Paul brings it up again and again. And he's so, he spends so much time around this, it's like he's trying to make sure that there's not any blame laid at his, you know, there's no charge against him concerning these things. He says, I want to be clear regarding what I'm saying to you. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. What we know about the Apostle Paul and the church in Corinth is that he was greatly undervalued by them. And that was wrong, right? Because he was a faithful instructor to their souls. He cared deeply for them. There are no letters as lengthy as the letters to the church at Corinth. Paul labored more abundantly concerning this church than any of the others. And he says that he didn't receive anything from their hands. Um, he deals with this topic again in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And in the beginning of this chapter, it shows us why he's dealing with this topic. Like I said, he was undervalued, though he was their most faithful instructor. But Paul, in his humility, he doesn't want to toot his own horn, right? He doesn't want to talk about what he is. So why is he even dealing with this topic at all? Verse number, chapter number 11 and verse 1. Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly. He acknowledges this is folly. I don't even want to talk. This is, I, I ought not have to be talking about this. And indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul says, my burden, the only reason that I'm dealing with this is I'm concerned for your souls. I'm concerned about how you're going to be presented to Jesus Christ. I want you to be faithful, uh, uh, entirely devoted to Him. I don't want you to be devoted to me. I don't want you to be devoted to any of these other men. I want you to be devoted to Christ. You're His bride. I'm just part of the bride like the rest of us. But I fear, he says, lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might but well bear with him. See, they were allowing in all types of perversion of the truth. They were getting off the, the mark. They were, you've left your first love, Corinth. And Paul says, I'm burdened for you. You're, you're inviting these in that would bring this false doctrine, these false apostles, he calls them in verse number 13, these deceitful workers, and you're bestowing this honor upon them. But those of us that are laboring in the Word of God and truly care for your souls, you count us as nothing. And so this is why he deals with this topic. He's burdened for them. Let's read on a little bit further in verse number, uh, verses 5 through 9. And we're going to see here that he has received wages, but not from Corinth. For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. But though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, uh, but we have, been thoroughly, we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? We read that in 1 Corinthians. I have made the gospel of God free of charge to you. Listen to verse number 8. I robbed other churches taking what? Wages. Wages of them. 
So see, he's not, he's not saying that he's against receiving wages for that which he's done. The labor is worthy of his hire. But he says, Corinth, it's been best for you to supply my own need by us working, and I've instead taken wages from other churches to minister to you. I've robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, guess what? The brethren which came from Macedonia, uh, that would have been Philippi, that region, uh, they supplied, uh, came from Macedonia, supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. So these other churches were providing for Paul, though he was laboring here in Corinth. Um, because he was intending to not be financially burdensome to them. Why is that? Verse number 10, As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. That's where Corinth was. Wherefore, why? Because I love you not, God knoweth. Paul said, it's the love of God in me. It's my love and my care for you that's prompted me to behave as I have, that it has prompted me to do this as I have. But what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may, may be found even as we. He says, we're going to bring to light the truth of those that are ministering among you. And he says, the false apostles and the deceitful workers are going to be revealed because they were the ones that were busy taking from the church. And he said, I was the one that was busy just laboring and not thinking about that. So that's the difference in the heart of the one that is burdened for the people and just serving because he has that charge from God and he's burdened for souls versus the ones that are there to just exploit them as they, many were doing among the Corinthian church. Why did I read all that? I wanted to read that because I don't want, to, want you to be confused. My point was that they used these, res, these funds that were coming into the church, they used these to provide for those that were laboring in the Word. Paul establishes that very clearly in multiple places. I received wages from the church in Philippi, in Macedonia. When they came to me, they supplied my need that you were failing to do, Corinth. So he's not saying that they shouldn't have provided these things. He's saying they should have. But he said, there's an issue here with these false teachers among you. And we're going to make a distinction as Paul did not receive benefit from them and as these others did. You can read on further in that. Where I don't want us to run out of time with the rest of the passages that, wow, we're already out of time. Um, Oh, how does it go by so fast? Um, verses 11 through 19, again, uh, just kind of read that when you have more time. He talks about how he was doing this thing, these things for their edification. He was, he was laboring uh, because he was cons laboring so in this manner because he, he was burdened truly for them. He wanted them to be edified and wanted them to be built up in the most holy faith. But like I said, the, the way in which he labored over this to me shows us how this was a difficult topic for the Apostle Paul to deal with. Let's, let's finish with this final thought here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we read something at the end of that. And verse number 14 In verse number 14, he says, uh, he wrote this to them, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And so I was asking the question, well, when did the Lord teach that? Did Christ ever teach on this topic? And if so, when did he? Go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10, in verse number 7, he says, And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely ha ye have received, how ought ye to give? Freely. Freely give. This was one of the verses that we read as far as how we give, right? We said the emphasis, the New Testament emphasis was not so much on the amount as it was how we give. You freely received, you ought to freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses nor scripts, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves. Why? For the workman is worthy of his meat. This is where Christ taught that. The workman is worthy of his meat. Look at Luke chapter 10. Similar passage here, phrased a little bit differently. Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10... And verse number 3, 
Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes, and salute no man by the way. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, Peace be to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. And if not, it shall turn to you again. Well, how are, how are we going to survive if we're not carrying any money with us? If we're not, we're not even carrying extra clothes with us? And in the same house, verse number 7, remain eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. In other words, those that you're ministering to will provide for you. God said, those are the hands that I will use to provide for you. Now listen to the end of this verse. Go not from house to house. I wonder how many pastors that condemns that jump from church to church so they can get a better deal. Jesus said, go not from house to house. Why? Because Paul said, it's not about what I receive in return. It's about I'm caring for your souls, and that's why I'm laboring as diligently as I am among you. Go not from house to house. You know, I don't really like the food over here, so we're going to jump over here to sister so-and-so's house. God said, don't do that. Enter in that house and remain there. And into whatsoever how, uh, city ye enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you, and heal the sick that are therein, and say unto them, The kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. So that's from the minister's perspective. God says that's what you ought to do. That's the attitude you ought to have. Not jumping from house to house, being thankful for that which I've prov provided in the hands from, uh, by whom I provided. But what about from the city's responsibility? Look at verse number 10. But into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, Go your ways out into the streets of the same, and say, Even the very dust of your city which cleaveth on us we do wipe off against you. Notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. So it was serious stuff on the flip side of it, right? Those that refused the, the uh, disciples and refused that word that they were preaching. Guys, I've got a lot more verses, and uh, I'm not intending to revisit this again, so write these down, okay? Romans 15.24, Romans 15.24, uh, 2 Corinthians 1.16. There you're going to see that Paul said, when I was coming to you, I was planning on you helping me on my way. He talks about that in Romans 15. I'm coming to you here in, in Rome, and I'm expecting you to help me on my way in this ministry. 3 John 1 through 8, and you'll see some other examples of that. So Romans 15, 24, 2 Corinthians 1, 16, 3 John 1 through 8. And then if you want to look at a, an Old Testament example, 2 Chronicles 31, 4 through 6, as God provided for those that labeled in the tabernacle there. We're out of time. Again, that took much longer than what I expected. It always seems to.